You welcome to the Policy Council. Today we focus on non-profits. And, and I take reflections from an international civil servant, a Nigerian who has worked with the United Nations Agency and has interesting reflections to offer our country. Enjoy the program. It's the Policy Council in 2014, and my guest today, she's an international civil servant. She's worked everywhere in the world, including some funny places. And today, she, we're sharing the reflections, her reflections on much of what she has done. E.A. Jonathan Ichava, you're welcome to the Policy Council. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Did I get that name correct? E.A. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my producer asked me, is she a Nigerian? Yeah. And yeah. I learned, I had someone ask you, are you from Uganda? <laughs> <laughs> I've been asked once whether I was from Russia as well. Uh, oh, really? Someone yeah. actually thought I was Each a other. Russian man. Oh, really? Until they met me. And, and when they see the Jonathan. Yes. That's your dad, right? That's my dad's first name. Okay. Yeah, when I was in secondary school, I got the funky idea that having a double barrel surname was really cool. Okay. <laughs> Interesting, uh, and uh, I find I find your your background very. I think the word is eclectic, international. Mm -hmm. You went to London School of Economics. Mm -hmm. uh, you studied economics. How, how was how was that? How was what was your experience at LSE? Um, well, actually, I used to have dreams of being what we would uh, being the equivalent of. Mrs. Okonjo Iwala. When I was a teenager, little did I know what economics entailed and the econometrics and all of that. Mm. So I went in to study economics there. But um, to be honest, I didn't really enjoy it so much because mm. I found it, well, British education tends to be very theoretical. Mm. So I found it very theoretical. I enjoyed very much the development economics mm. aspect of things yeah. and some of the microeconomics. And so it's no surprise you so drifted exactly, into development. Exactly. So I really enjoyed some of that. Um, overall, it was a fantastic experience just mm. meeting so many people, some of them whom I'm still very close friends with. Mm. Um, and it was quite an experience being in the LSE because the LSE has a real tradition of being very activist. Mm. Um, in fact, when we went in, it was legend that the students at one time had closed down the school and closed down the city streets they're part of um, in protest over some tax that the UK government had levied or mm. something like that. Mm. So they had that real tradition. So they were, although they're very Ivy League in one way... Y you must be have there. been a teenager in your early years at LSE. Um, was I? I'm trying to remember now. Actually, yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I was. Uh -huh. uh, well, just so you, about that. So you lived in London alone. I'm asking yes. because my daughters are there. So <laughs> how, does, how does that feel? Um, luckily, prior to going to that, I had been in boarding school since okay. I was about eight or nine years old. Okay. So I developed some sort of independence. Mm. And um, in my meetings, um, I got, had a very strong faith experience. Mm. And so I was very um, focused in okay. my mind okay. on what I wanted to do mm. with my person, with my mm. life, the kind of character I wanted to have. Mm. So even being in London, there were a lot of distractions, absolutely. Mm. Um, but for me, I had already had that training, I mean, from home. And of course, when you're going to England, your mom will call you and say, don't go and disgrace you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so... And, uh, and then you did this, bad. yeah, you did this Master of Professional Studies in Political Management mm. at George Washington. That's the U.S. this yeah. time. Yeah. And then what was that about? Well, basically, um, I finished, and as you can tell, as you said, I do have a very checkered background. <laughs> and so I had come back, went into Christian ministry for a while, went into banking, went into advertising, and ended up in non-profit sector. Mm. And while I was working with UNICEF, I realized I did need to have a master's degree. Now, I couldn't afford to take time off and go and do one. And I'd heard about a friend of mine who had done his PhD online with George Washington University. Now, George Washington is also pretty Ivy League. Mm. I mean, one of my rules for myself was, if you're going to spend that kind of money, you might as well spend it in a school mm. where when people see it on your CV, they're like, okay, I want to talk to this person. Mm. Um, so it was not cheap, mm. uh, but thankfully I was working. And um, I wanted to actually, I started out actually with a doing a degree in strategic public relations. Mm. Um, but I was given the option to switch over to political management because I had a real interest in politics. Mm. Um, and the reason being, with particularly with my work with UNICEF here in Nigeria, I was the head of um, heading the private sector fundraising unit here. Um, we got to, of course, in the programs, in some of the health programs, the immunization programs, I got to see a sense or get a sense of how much politics could affect 
for good or for bad, mm. you know, development outcomes mm. for children, for all of us, for mm. our lives. Mm. You know, if you appoint the wrong person into power or into position, whether as a commissioner or whether as a director, I mean, some of the appointments are obviously political, mm -hmm. um, but they impact on the work of the technical people at mm. the field. So if you have the wrong person in place, for example, they might not sign off on things to get the vaccines out in mm. time, yeah. and that has a ripple effect on the welfare of children or the welfare of mothers and mm. the rest of us as well. Mm. So those are some of the things that, that made, made you realize, make this switch you know, to yeah, political money. It's interesting to, to understand that. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. I'm having what promises to be a fascinating discussion with my friend EA, Jonathan Ichaba. She's worked in non-profits much of her life and she's had this fantastic global experience. We'll be right back. Who knows Abi better thing? Abi who knows like better thing? Ha. Ah. Hmm. Who did find fine things where they see so? Now money go make they say do I now? Abi? I think it's like, you know, I mean, excuse me, I did pay my tax. I did do a thing. I did pay my tax. Say you don't pay your own tax. If you pay your tax, I pay oh. Pay your tax. It's your civic responsibility. It's your duty. It's the law. You welcome back. It's still the Policy Council and I'm speaking with EA Jonathan Icheva. She's from Benue State, Nigeria, not from Russia or Kazakhstan. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah, um, you, you just came back from the Geneva office of mm -hmm. UNICEF um, and, um, and you were there for four years yes. the equivalent of a of a tenure of a political of an elected president Absolutely. tell me tell me I, 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 and while you were away I noticed that we were quite in touch on Facebook on Absolutely. social media mm -hmm. so you, you were not out of Nigeria not at all in, in, at in, all. in, 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 in fact I came in, in virtual time. time not at all uh -huh. and physically too I came in at least uh, three times a year wow. I tried to I okay tried to, yeah. so so what were your perceptions what did you think was going on in your country while you were in Geneva uh, well I was pretty much I was very in touch mm. um, read the newspapers every day online had discussions I'm one of those die hard believe in Nigeria passionate give up everything this country needs to work kind of people. Mm. Um, so I constantly kept in touch. I think for me, um, just being there and doing some of the work and working across, you know, just relating with different countries, I realized that um, we need to have a real sense of urgency about mm. our issues in mm. Nigeria. We don't a lot mm. of the time. It's all about, oh, God will take care of us. We will be fine. God, these are whatever. It will pass. This too shall pass and whatever. And I realized it doesn't work that way. Mm. And you can't fix your problems if you're not urgent about them. Mm. I mean, you can tell I'm from UNICEF in many ways, or mm. I'm an ex-UNICEF person, because everything about UNICEF is the issues are now. If we don't get the funding now, the children are going to suffer. Mm. You know, so we need this now. And it's mm. the same philosophy. Every day we read the papers in Nigeria, there's one issue or the other. Not to say there are not good things happening, mm. but we need a real sense of urgency. So all throughout my time there, there was a real sense of, I want to go back home and do my bit. Mm. I mean, yeah, I'm representing my country in one way here, but um, it's good to take that knowledge and bring it back home, to be able to really put it out there and say, this is, you know, we need to move and we need to move fast. Mm. Sometimes when you're in, you know how they say about a frog getting used to the temperature of the water as it rises? I think sometimes we kind of get into that mood yes. here. Um, but what I found with a lot of my friends, non-African, um, an African, they find that Nigerians are real go-getters. Mm. And um, the, a lot of the Nigerians they've met outside of Nigeria, and even when they come to Nigeria, I hear it all the time, mm. um, they always say things like, that place is an amazing place. You've got so much potential. You've got people who are go-getters. You've got people who are leading in different fields around the world. Um, even amongst Africans, we have the reputation for, the, my, my non-African friends would always say to me, when you walk into a place you see a Nigerian, you know a Nigerian, mm. because they know what they're about, they know what they're going after. So I think in many ways, um, we've managed professionally to put our best foot forward. I think there are a few bad eggs who unfortunately have made huge noise, mm. the drug dealers, the mm. 419ers, mm. and those are the things, unfortunately, that we've not been able to manage and that have affected the perceptions of Nigerians 
um, everywhere. Let me, let me ask you a question uh, now, go, going into the work you did, the core of the work mm. you did at UNICEF, mm. which, which would it be right to say this was as a fundraising specialist, mm -hmm. particularly in Nigeria? Yes. What, what was that about? What, what were you doing? Well, actually, I've always been a fundraiser, of one kind or the other. <laughs> Even when I was a student at university, I remember in church we would go and fundraise in London on the tubes, really? um, raising money for missions work in, mm. in, uh, in India or wherever. And that really it started, started it for me because I would walk up to strangers and say, you know, we're doing this, buy a brick for whatever, do you know, would you like to donate a pound? You know, well, what we call now in today's lingo is called, in the fundraising lingo, it's called face-to-face -face fundraising. Mm. So I used to do that on the tubes quite a bit um, with some friends. And some friends hated it. You know, they didn't like people when they said no. For me, it was like, okay, you say no, fine. The next person will give. They don't give. I'll keep going until someone gives me the money. You know, so it didn't phase me. So mm. I just continued in that vein. So even when I was in the bank working, I was always organizing one swim at one, swimming 100 laps to raise money for something or the other. So I was always going around with my piece of paper. Eh, Oga, please, I'm doing this. Can you, fund, can you sponsor me? So I found I really enjoyed it. And mm. so when I eventually drifted into that line of work, it just came naturally. Mm. So um, I did that in Nigeria for a while, just doing that kind of fundraising. Uh, my specialization eventually became corporate fundraising, mm -hmm. fundraising okay. from companies, and just mobilizing resources for UNICEF's work, mm. um, or trying to just leverage their own assets mm. and resources for the work for children. Um, I eventually went over, and going over to Geneva was actually to support different countries doing the same thing I was doing here in Nigeria. So all our country offices. So I had quite a large... If any country yeah. wanted to talk to a company, they would come to me okay. for policy guidance, for strategic guidance. Mm. What can we do? And so some of that informed some of the missions I went on in different countries to mm. help them Pakistan, also do that. Uh, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan. So Pakistan was coming on the back of a flood emergency they had, and they needed some support, reaching out to, to companies mm. on how they could support. Excellent. So was that. We'll be right back. I'm with Air, Jonathan Nicheba, and we're having a very good discussion. We'll be right back. You welcome back. It's the Policy Council. We're talking about the global NGO sector. But I have a question for you here mm -hmm. on Nigeria and NGO sector. I have a hypothesis that um, in Nigeria we have a Midas touch and anything we touch turns to gold. It does appear as if even that sector is abused in Nigeria. What do mm. you think? think? Especially when you're talking about fundraising. About fundraising. I think that uh, the NGO sector, I think, is largely misunderstood hmm. externally and internally. When I say externally, I mean people external to the sector. Um, I've actually had a lot of people say to me, oh, so, you know, I left UNICEF to work on a foundation that I had founded with a, a, f a few people um, a couple of years ago. And uh, they say things like, oh, foundation, ah, that means you have a lot of money. Mm. You know, ah, you must be getting a lot of money. You know, so for a lot of people, they actually believe that a foundation or an NGO is about getting money and making money. Mm -hmm. And even when I was in Geneva, I'd get phone calls from people. Some people actually affiliated to some of our government uh, people saying, oh, my X, Y, Z, whatever, one's wife wants to do this. They want to set up this foundation. How can we get funding? And I remember one in particular, I said, you know, I can't, no one can fundraise for you if you don't have a solid track record, mm. you know, established of delivering on programs, you know, delivering the results for whatever it is. So I think, um, so people don't, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about NGO work. Mm. Um, it is the non-governmental sector. It is not for profit. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some of the perceptions around it's Nigeria, actually this problem or this challenge is, very endemic across different uh, in Africa, mm. in Asia. I've heard stories about Bangladeshi ones and Indian ones and whatever. So sometimes you hear stories about people taking funds and doing nothing with them. But you do have the few who do some, some solid work. work. Unfortunately, those who abuse the process, we hear more about those abuses mm. than those who are really taking their time and delivering. It's a lot of work. I would say um, NGO work is really about, first and foremost, it's about a passion and having a heart and mm. compassion for whatever it is you're working on, whether you're working for homeless children, mm. and it's not something to get into simply because it's the in thing. Because mm. I think sometimes Nigeria, we, well, it's not just Nigeria, it's a common phenomenon. Everybody sees something that seems to be working, and they jump on that bandwagon without understanding the implications. So, for example, if you're setting out with, you have to have a strategic plan. What do you want to achieve in five years? Mm. 
um, what we had in the past and still have some time. People hear, oh, there's money in this sector mm. and they just run to it and switch their plan all over. And that messes up everything. Mm. Um, I will say one thing, uh, hopefully not too politically incorrect. I see that in Nigeria in the next few months or years, given the <laughs> situation we have with the gay rights issue, we're going to have issues around NGOs all of a sudden springing up, going on about sexual freedoms, mm. you know, because that is where it's money is money now is available be. for that. You know, we had that with HIV and all of that. So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding mm. around um, NGO work, and it's, uh, it's not something that one can quickly get a grasp of in mm. a day. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I've read this very interesting lessons from the International Civil Service, a three-part um, article you've uh, written in, yeah. in, in one newspaper. Mm. And um, I, found, I found a lot of interesting insights. One of which is that you've, you've hinted at that. You had colleagues who were killed in the UN Absolutely. bombing, Bombings. UN house bombing yes, in Abuja. Abuja. Mm -hmm. People you knew personally. Absolutely. How did People you I feel? Worked with. Um, I People who were staff of UNICEF. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I remember the day the call came. Um, it had happened. I just got a call from my colleague here. She said, it has happened. They've bombed us. I was like, what? They've bombed us. So I was shaking. By then, it wasn't even on the news. We mm. didn't, it hadn't, people hadn't heard. So I went and told my boss immediately, whom we had a very good relationship. And she said, don't say anything. Because, you know, we didn't know who was in the office, who was on a mission there or not. Um, and um, it was just, um, it was heartbreaking. Mm. It was heartbreaking. Um, mm. People whom uh, were here from, you know, had a, a Kenyan colleague, a very dear colleague um, who was gone, uh, another... You know, people with families, you mm. know, I think sometimes in the political, we forget that these are these were individuals with families, with loved ones, with children who, you know, have now, um, have now gone as a result of this violence. Mm. Um, it, was, um, it was horrible. Unfortunately, this is an increasing phenomenon, phenomenon. something that's happening in their attacks. I mean, in the last attack where um, uh, I think a car bomb was given into a restaurant in Kabul, in Kabul we also yeah. lost two, two UNICEF two colleagues, colleagues there as well. So it's a constant danger and it's escalating. Hmm. Um, let, let, let's take a short time out and we'll come back to this. Mm. I see it's a sober moment for you. We'll be right back. Government wants our city to become a mega modern city. And so government is providing modern markets for us to carry out our business. Now, this requires money, so we need to pay our taxes to help government to help us. I pay my taxes. I hope you've paid yours. I pay. Pay your tax. It's your civic responsibility. It's your duty. It's the law. You're welcome to my last segment. I've been having a fascinating conversation. I, you wish you were in my shoes with a very beautiful lady who has a very beautiful intellect as well. And, and she's written these lessons from the International Civil Service. Effectively, her reflections on her seven and a half, almost eight years mm -hmm. at UNICEF in the Nigerian office and in Geneva. Yeah. And, and one of the things I find interesting for those who seek job, you just saw an advert in the newspapers yep. and you applied. Absolutely. And you say those job adverts may be genuine. Yep. And you've got nothing to lose. Try. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You don't have to know someone in the mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. Have a little faith. Keep calm. Stay focused. At the interview, be honest. If you do not know, you don't know. Yep. Um, and when you get there, I, I found this interesting. <laughs> Keep quiet until you understand. Yeah, Don't talk too much. Yes. And Nigerians, we tend to talk too much. Yes. I have done it before. <laughs> so if, have I. <laughs> <laughs> take the time to know how the organization functions. And this is not just UNICEF. You get anyway. into a new job, into a new bank. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to talk about this. One reflection here. You say African good governance and equitable, equitable economic growth, not foreign aid is our salvation. Tell mm. me about that. I think a lot of the time in my work, as, uh, I used to find it very fascinating that when we went into communities here locally, people would say to us, the chiefs or the people, UNICEF, UN, come and help us, so we're suffering here, we're dying here, and I would say, it's not our job to, we're here to support and give aid, your mm. government is mm. the one to make sure these things are, and the people, and yourselves, mm. and the business people, you need to get them together. Mm. Um, I think there's that. Um, we have that really upside down view, hmm. you know, and there have been discussions about this and books written about this, um, you know, more recently. You Dead know, aid, 
is not the answer. You know, for mm. example, better aid, mm. uh, Damisa's book. Damisa yeah. um, aid is not the answer, mm. right? Aid is there to support you, you know, just like post-World War II, mm. when aid was given to Europe to help them reconstruct. Mm. So it was just aid to support for a while, right? It's about we Nigerians banding together and beginning to say, this is what we want to achieve for our country, and beginning to call our leaders to give us accountable, proper leadership. Hmm. You, you also speak about, the con in the context of Ngoji Okonjo Wella's mm. bid for the World Bank presidency, yeah. you, you imply that given if, if Nigeria with its over 160 million people is not a serious world economic power, has a few solid industries, does not have a particularly solid reputation for good governance, mm. ranks 157 on the Human Development Index, has waning economic significance. In short, if you are from a country that no one respects is unlikely you, you will be made the president of the World Bank. Um, yes, I'm sorry to say that. Mm. Um, I would not say necessarily no one respects. Mm. Nigeria has, Nigerians have respect and some Nigerians don't have respect. I would say the face we've put out, one, to our indices, because the reality of things are this, right? The, the international politics economics is such that these institutions... It's about real politics. It's new real politics. In resources needed hmm. and if for example I'm the president of the World Bank I cannot convince my own government to put money in Syria for hmm. example who might need funding because my own country is a recipient of aid they themselves have not got their act together yeah. you know they're not going to go and pick me because hmm. we know there are challenges in the world hmm. and they need people so even though we Nigerians were brilliant in our individual selves we need to band together and put forth and fix our country and fix our country and this is something I always say to Nigerians in the diaspora or those in the night, the brilliant ones who want to go abroad for a better life. It's good to go. I'm not saying please don't go. We all need to if you want to experience it. But do remember, there's only so far you can go because you will always be a Nigerian. Hmm. And you always have that Nigerian passport. Let me ask you, that I, I want to talk about CESO Foundation, your okay. foundation. Mm -hmm. But one last reflection. Absolutely. Insulting government officials and agents will not get your road fixed. That's something I learned from UNICEF and the UN, the way they work advocacy, engaging, constructive engagement. Mm. I can say my governor or my whoever it is, you can say your local government chairman, whoever. You can say, oh, he's, an idiot, he's a foolish person. You write him a letter. You write all kinds of things insulting him. He's not going to fix your road. Mm. What would probably get the job done more is going every day, knocking on his door, saying, okay, my road needs to be fixed. In your promises, in none of that, this is what you said. Because mm. it's not about the person. Mm. We make it too personal. Mm. Oh, this person is an idiot. He's stupid. That's not the point. Mm. The point is, he got into that job, or she got into the job, believes they're able to deliver, so flat deliver. Mm. It's not about you and me. Mm. It's about my road needing to get fixed, and get fixed to the best possible standard, mm. or whatever it is. Okay, so tell us, final word, tell me about this CESO Empowerment Foundation. Okay, so CESO yeah. means... That is now your that own... That is now my... It's called, in TV, it means we will repair, we will fix. And I'm mm. sure you understand where that comes from. It's about us not just depending and thinking, oh, it's the government's fault, it's the UN's fault, it's America's fault. The bottom line, the problem is ours because we all suffer it and we need to fix it. Um, and so currently we work in four areas. Um, I'll save the best for last. We work in educational support, empowerment, emergency support. And we have a program called MOVE, which is really about constructive public sector engagement, which is what I've been talking about. Not mm -hmm. insulting your governor, but mm -hmm. you know, giving feedback and saying we need more and we need you to do this. Um, and I think uh, the whole idea came about there was fighting in my father's village and we went to do some interviews with the young people to find out what there was, why there was fighting. In fact, his house got burnt, you know, for the, sec house. Yes, for the second time in as whatever. Yeah. And um, we're like, why do you fight all the time? Oh, we don't have jobs. I said, so what do you think can change, can make this change? Oh, but you people, if you come and help us. I said, we don't live in the village. Whoever is arming you to fight yourselves doesn't live here. You know, it's about you. We can provide some support. Again, that same mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what it, um, that's what brought about that idea. And we've been doing some work, uh, mainly in Benue. We've now expanded some of our work into Lagos and that's setting up here. Um, and in Lagos, we've supported about 150 children mm -hmm. to go on and get their first school living certificate. Mm -hmm. We are currently, we've just completed the first round of an internship program here um, in Lagos and where moving on and moving on to the last, uh, next things. I'll just talk about MOVE very quickly because I know we're short on time. Um, MOVE really is about us getting together and I'm trying to make connections with people like, groups like Gen Voices, for example, Enough is Enough, mm. and whoever else we can connect with, um, to really band together and say, you know, for example, there's an issue. Say, for example, Lekki Ekpe Expressway, 
there are no pedestrian stops, no traffic lights for people to cross. But constantly, and God help you if you're trying to cross that road, it's, it's like a death trap. Mm. You know, you could get together and say, you know, let's okay. talk to whoever is in charge of this. Who is in charge of doing this? You know, whose responsibility is it? Can we get this going on? Mm. Community, everybody, let's engage, let's get, that's just one facet. Mm. Or I have a, we have a situation with customs now, for example, trying to clear a container is something else. Mm. It's a nightmare. Mm. Um, and it's not about going and saying, oh, customs people are useless. It's about saying this was what was good in the process. They were very polite. This was what was not good. You didn't have all the information and all the rules. Therefore, you delayed it and it accrued demerage. These are the suggestions for me moving it forward. And we keep following up until there's some change. Mm. It's slow, but that's the only way it gets done. So that's what um, CISO is about. CISO is about. I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for coming on the Policy Council. And thank you. We'll be right back. I'm sure you'll agree with me that was an interesting discussion. I'll take one important takeaway from my guest. Insulting your councillor, your governor, your rep will not get your road fixed. Engage with him constructively. One other reflection. We are the ones who have to fix Nigeria. United Nations, the American government, US, UN, all the agencies outside Nigeria cannot, will not fix our country. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.